How was your day? You don't sound convinced yet. I had a wonderful day and just had a chance to be with a great group of students who want to talk about NTS. We had a little pizza party and about, I would guess, 20 or so that came and that was fun. I want to invite you back tomorrow morning and just to tell you, when I, when I do these chances, when I have chances to speak, I, I always have a few things in mind that I might do, but I kind of wait to get there and just keep praying and see maybe where the Lord is leading. And, and Corey, this will be news to you, but we're going to change a few things. So I think you, and you're okay with that. I know that. But um, tomorrow morning, I want to talk about the question, um, why, why did Jesus die? And we're going to talk about a big word called atonement, but, but I really want to address that question is, uh, why did Jesus die and what difference does it make? And then tomorrow night, we're going to shift gears, and I want to talk tomorrow night about the question about, about where is God when we're suffering? And when you have questions like, why, why do things like Newtown happen? And, and when we're faced with things like 9-11 and Newtown and those, those devastating moments, where, where is God when those things happen? And how can we live and how can we learn to have faith even in those kind of devastating times? So that's what I want to do tomorrow night. And uh, so take your Bibles with me and turn to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. Before we look at that, let me give you a little background. According to rabbinical tradition, she was one of the foremost beautiful women in the ancient world. And not only was she known for her surpassing beauty, but she was also known for her incredible faith. And of all the great women in Israel's history, she is mentioned more often in the New Testament than any other woman except for Sarah, the wife of Abraham. She became this greatly revered woman of faith, so revered, in fact, that of all the faces that could have appeared on the Mount Rushmore of famous people of faith, guess what? Her face appears there. But she didn't start out that way because she was a woman with a past. Now, everyone has a past, of course. We all have a past. We all have a place where we've come from. All of us, indeed, have things that we wish we hadn't done or things that we're ashamed of. And if we had to do them over again, we would. Everybody has a past. But there are some people who live with a painful past. There's people who live with a past that, that they've tried to bury so deep that they just pray nobody will ever discover that past. Or, or there, it's the kind of a past where people do happen to know a little bit about where you've come from, and no matter how much you try to keep putting it behind you, there are certain folks who just will not let you forget. And maybe you know the kind of past that, that I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about the past that, that weighs so heavy that it feels like it's, it's just crushing you. And a past for, for some of you maybe tonight that feels so shameful that it just you think about it and, and it's hard to breathe. You know what I'm talking about? I've known a lot of people who've had a past like that, and I know some of the questions that they wonder, will I ever be free of some of the guilt and shame that I have because of my past? I know that I've been forgiven. I, I know that I'm in a right relationship with God, but I just, will I ever feel forgiven? Will I ever be able to forgive myself for where I've been? Can I ever get past my past? Well, as Christians, we know that, that Jesus came to forgive and redeem our past and, and to give us an incredible future. And, 
And here's what I think is going to happen tonight. I believe that there's some people here who, who are going to experience a freedom in their life that they've never known before. I believe something's going to happen tonight for some of you where God is going to cleanse your minds, where He's going to wash away your guilt, where He's going to give you hope, and He's going to give you, for some of you, a fresh start. Many of you are going to experience God's grace to set you free from no matter what you've done. Because if God could do that, Pastor, for a woman named Rahab, He can do that for anybody. And I mean anybody. Let's pray about this. Father, I have a past. When I think about who I was and what you've done in my life, I am still amazed. And it's been almost 30 years But I remember. And I know you did something for me I couldn't do for myself. And even to this day, I'm amazed by your grace. There's some people here tonight, God, who really wondered if they wanted to come because they knew what this sermon was going to be about. And even the fact that I bring up the issue of someone's past, it made somebody's heart beat a little faster and it made some people's breathing get a little stronger. Those are the very feelings, God, tonight that I hope you can set us free from. And tonight, will you use my words, my simple words, and will you take the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together And make them acceptable and pleasing and glorifying to you. And edifying for us. This is our prayer. And everybody said together, amen. Amen. Can can you just turn to your neighbor and just say, thanks for being here tonight. I'm glad you're here. All right, here we go. The setting of Rahab's story happened 3,500 years ago. That's a long time. But even 40 years before the 3,500 years ago, something amazing happened for the people of God. And that was that God delivered His people from bondage of the most powerful superpower in the known world called Egypt. They were under oppression, they were in slavery, and God literally redeemed them out of that. But here's what's happened. Since their deliverance of the past 40 years, by their own decisions, the people of God have just been meandering around in the wilderness. They've been like nomads in the desert. But now they have a brand new moment. They're on the brink of entering the promised land. And in Joshua chapter 2, here's where the reading picks up. Joshua 2, follow along with me if you have a Bible. Verse 1, it says this. Then Joshua, son of Nun secretly sent two spies from Shittim. You want to pronounce that one correctly. (laughs) Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. Jericho. Now, this is an interesting city. This is considered one of the oldest cities in the world. In fact, there's some evidence that there was some kind of a settlement in Jericho dating all the way back to 9000 B.C. How many of you know that's a long time ago? 9000 B.C. It was a massive city, and for its time it had thousands of people living in Jericho and around Jericho, and it was so well protected and fortified because it was an important city that they had built one of the most amazing forts that you've ever seen. It had a large, and we, we've actually been able to do this through archaeology. We found out what the city might have been like. There was a large, huge mound of earth surrounded by an embankment. It had a stone retaining wall that was about 15 feet high at its base. And then on top of that retaining wall was a second level of retaining wall, which was about 25 feet tall. And on top of that 25-foot-tall retaining wall was a third wall that was 45 feet tall. 
which meant that if you were standing down on the bottom and looking up, you would be looking up at a wall that was over 70 feet high and was so thick, was so thick that it was said that you could drive two chariots side by side around the top of those walls. It was truly a daunting sight, and it may not feel daunting to you today, but think about, think about what it was like 4,000 years ago. It's just stunning. And Joshua knew that in order for them to be able to go into the promised land, one of the first cities they were going to have to deal with was this city of Jericho, and so he decided he was going to do some recon. And he sent a couple of spies. He selected two Navy SEAL guys to do a really dangerous job. Now look at what it says in the end of verse 1. He said, I'm going to send you into Jericho. And so they went and they entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab. And they stayed there. Now this is the first time in Scripture that Rahab's name is mentioned. And immediately we know three things about Rahab. These are three strikes against Rahab. Strike number one, she was a woman and not a man. Now why would that be a strike against her? You all know that in that day and age, women were looked down upon. Women didn't have the dignity they have today, and they certainly had no authority in culture and society like women have today, as it should be. There was actually a prayer called the Baraka, the Baraka Blessing that went something like this. <clears throat> Blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe, for not having made me a Gentile. Blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe, for not having made me a slave. And blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe, for not having made me a woman. And that prayer was prayed by every Jewish man every day. Strike number one. Rahab was a woman and not a man. Strike number two, she was a Canaanite and not a Jew. Who were the Canaanites? The Canaanites were the people who lived in that land. They were later called Gentiles. Maybe you've heard that in the New Testament. They were very famous at that time for being crude and cruel and very pagan. They were noted for their grossly immoral practices, including ritualistic child sacrifices. And among other things, they frequently would put, I know this is going to sound gross and crude, but they would take actually live babies, put them in jars, build them into the foundations of their city as sacrifices to their gods. Horrible things. They were also extremely polytheistic, which means that they worshipped a whole lot of gods. I found 24 different gods that the Canaanites worshipped. That's a lot of gods to try and keep happy, by the way. Rahab was one of them. She was a Canaanite. But strike number three, Rahab was a prostitute, which meant that in the grand scheme of things, she was not even a very good woman or a very good Canaanite either. She was a prostitute. She sold her body for money. Now, there were two kinds of prostitutes during that day. First of all, there were what we call temple prostitutes, and they were called the Kedeshah. Kedeshah. They were women who were maybe used in religious rituals to the Canaanite gods, and, and they were slightly more acceptable than their other counterparts. But then there was a second kind of prostitute, and that was your streetwalker. Hooker type prostitute. They were called zonas. And they were the lowest rung of prostitutes. Those are the ones that were on the street every night, not just being a part of temple worship, but trading sexual favors for payment. That's how they made their living. A lot of women on the street had to do that in order to survive. Well, guess which one Rahab was? She was a zona. She was the lower rung type. She was a lady of the night who, in fact, apparently was running a kind of business, a shady business that she was well known for. It's interesting to me that, that many of the early commentators on Joshua, you know, people who try to interpret the book of Joshua, they tried to de-emphasize the fact that she was a prostitute. They would say things like this, you know, Rahab wasn't really a prostitute. She was kind of more like an innkeeper. 
Or Rahab wasn't really a prostitute. She was just a person who owned a hotel where prostitution sometimes happened. Or one ancient commentator, one of my favorites named Rashi, he actually said that, that she was someone who just sold food to establishments like brothels so the prostitutes could eat. So he really took a dive in and said, you know, she was a great person. No! No! She was a prostitute. She was a common harlot who sold her body on the street to make a living. And the Bible never tries to tell us anything different than that. In fact, listen, Rahab is mentioned eight times in the Scriptures. Five of those eight times she is identified not just by her name but by her occupation. Rahab the prostitute, Rahab the harlot, five of the eight times that she's mentioned. The Bible never tries to make her more noble than she was or more dignified than she was or more righteous than she was. She had a reputation. She was known for what she did. And she had a past. And we're not going to try to decide how she came to that. Maybe something terrible had happened in her life. Maybe a husband had died. Maybe she'd been thrown out on the street. Maybe she was an orphan. There's a lot of reasons why women were prostitutes in that day and age. But let's get that thing settled right up front. Rahab was a prostitute. Which begs the question how these two Israelite spies ended up at her doorstep. But that's probably for another sermon. You can only speculate why they ended up at Rahab's place. Maybe they thought that she actually was running a hotel. Or, or maybe they thought it was a place, you know, a lot of men are going to show up at a place like Rahab's, and a lot of men from out of town are going to show up, and if we start wandering around the streets with our accent and our features, people are going to know who we are, and so maybe let's go to a place where they would expect foreign men to be. Maybe that was the reason they went there. Or maybe she was there, and they came to her because of the providence of God in her life, and for theirs. All we know is that they did show up at her door, and Rahab instantly recognizes who they are. She knows they're not from around those parts, and it wouldn't have been uncommon for different men to show up at a place of prostitution, but the city of Jericho, you've got to remember, was already on high alert. They were already aware that there were some Israelite spies somewhere along the way, and so they were on the lookout for them. In fact, the king of Jericho, the Bible says, even got word somehow that these two strange men had showed up at Rahab's place who looked an awful lot like Israelites. And so the king of Jericho ends up sending a group of CIA Jericho style to her house. He said, go check it out. And so they come to Rahab's house. They knock on the door. They say, Rahab, we have information that leads us to believe that Israelite soldiers have come to spy on our city and eyewitnesses tell us that they have come to your house. So why don't you go ahead and just turn them over to us? But for whatever reason, she convinces the two, the Israelite spies that danger was already imminent. She was anticipating that there would be a call at her house and she knew it was going to happen. And so she said, I want you to go and hide And so she has now taken these two Israelite spies, they are on her rooftop, and she hides them, this is a very important fact, under bundles of flax, F-L-A-X. We're going to come back to that. That's an important little uh, tidbit here. She hides them under bundles of flax. And then, at great risk to herself... She concocts a story to the CIA about these two men had been there, but they had already left, and she knows that they're going out of the city, and if they hurry, they might catch them. And remarkably, the CIA believes her, because they do not search the house, which I doubt was because they didn't have a search warrant, and they then rush out of the city in hot pursuit of two phantoms that they're not going to catch. Now, my brother and sister, I want to tell you, that was a very dangerous thing for Rahab to do. First of all, it was dangerous because if it was discovered that she was aiding and abetting the enemy by hiding them or protecting them and covering up for them, it would mean that she would be a traitor. It would be certain death for her and probably certain death for her family. 
Which leads me to a, a question, why would she do that? Why would she take a risk like that? And I thought a lot about this, and I've tried, and, and I don't know if this is the right answer or not, but the way the story ends up, it, you're going to love the end of this story, by the way, but the way it ends up, it leads me to believe that something was going on in Rahab's heart. God was at work stirring her heart in such a way that she was, for the first time in her life maybe, being drawn to something more real than all the idols of Jericho. And for the first time in her life, she began to think that maybe my life might be more than a label. My whole life has been lived with a label. I've had this life of degradation and disgrace. I've had to look at strange men all of my life. I've had to make excuses for my existence. And I've given away so much of myself that I'm not even sure I know who I am anymore. But suddenly she's being drawn by this grace that is capturing her heart. And faith is being born in this woman who has given up on hope. And we know that that's true because of what happens next. Take a look at verse 9. This is, an, this is an amazing statement. When the CIA leaves her house, she goes back up to the roofs, pulls out the guys out from underneath the flax, and she has this amazing conversation. Verse 9 says, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear has fallen on us. So that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. I want to tell you something. Rahab has just become the first Gentile to profess faith in God Almighty. And this is what she says. She says, I know, I know in my heart that God has done what he said he was going to do. I believe he is going to lead you into this city. And then Rahab the prostitute suddenly becomes Rahab the believer because she says in verse 11, the Lord your God is God in heaven above and he is God on earth below. I believe this. And the greatest declaration of faith in the entire book of Joshua does not come from Joshua. It comes from Rahab the prostitute. She said, I want to acknowledge something. I believe that he is the one true God. I believe that he reigns supreme over everything. And despite the odds stacked against me, I believe that God can deliver on his promise. And she says, I will make a deal with you because I know that the Lord is going to deliver this city. And I know that this city is going to be defeated by the army of the Lord, but I want your God to be my God, and so I am going to act on my faith, and I am going to show you loving kindness in advance so that when he does save you, that you will show me loving kindness in return. And the spies say, sounds like a good deal to me. We don't have another plan. And so they make a covenant with her. And Rahab helps them escape by letting them rappel down the side of the wall with a rope through her window. But watch this. Before they leave, something very interesting happens. The spies tell her, look Rahab, when this city gets attacked, it's going to get messy. It's going to be chaotic People are going to be screaming, going to be running around. We've got to find a way to protect you. We've got to find a way to identify who you are. And so here's what we want you to do. We want you to take this scarlet fabric. We want you to take this, this crimson cord that you use to identify your profession. And when we see this red cord hanging Over the door of your house, listen to the exact words, we will pass over it, we will spare your life, and destruction will not come to you or anybody in your house. Now this is is an amazing thing I found out about this passage. You want to know what the scarlet cord was? That's actually what prostitutes hung in their windows and their doors to tell their customers they were open for business. How many of you have ever heard of the red light district? That's where this came from. Ancient harlots would take and hang crimson things in their windows and say, come on in. But 
there's a very intentional allusion here to another part of Israel's history. Now stay with me for just a second, because if you get this, a lot of things are going to make sense. About the time that God rescues Israel from Egypt, on the final night before their exodus, God tells the people, my angel is going to pass through this land and strike down every firstborn Egyptian. But I want you to have all the Israelites take the blood of a lamb and wipe it over the doorpost of their homes and death will, what? Pass over their house and they will all be saved. Wherever the blood of the lamb is seen, I will pass over. We also know that the Passover is being alluded to here because of the flax. You remember the flax? That was the plant Rahab hid people under. That's significant because flax was what was used during harvest time to bring a wave offering to the Lord on the first Sunday of what? Passover. See, Joshua is being really clear here. This has Passover implications all over it. And this is an incredibly important moment for Rahab because God is now providing her protection and giving her deliverance by covering, covering her house with a red cord of mercy. So look, here's what's happening. God is taking what has been the symbol of her sin and is now going to transform it and make it the symbol of her salvation. Nobody said amen, so I'm going to say that one more time. God took what had been the symbol of her sin, the red cord, and transformed it to become the symbol of her salvation. Now that's good. That's a good amen. She believes God's promise. She puts her trust in his salvation, and she acts on it with her faith. And there's a guy named H. Orton Wiley who's a really famous old guy who is a Nazarene scholar. This is what he says. There is no clearer evidence of salvation by faith in the Bible than this event. That's a pretty big statement. Now, you better buckle your seatbelt because the rest of the story is miraculous. Okay, take your Bibles, flip over a couple chapters, go to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went in and no one went out. So do you get the picture? Fortified. Gates are locked. Nobody in, nobody out. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See... I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. And Joshua's going, really? I don't see that quite yet. I see a fortified city, completely locked up, 70 feet high, really, really big, a big army. And God says, but I have a plan. And here's what I want the plan to be. It's great military strategy here. I want you to march around the entire city with all, the, all of the marching band. And, and I want you to make any sound except the playing of trumpets of the priest advancing before the ark of the Lord. Just okay. And, and Joshua goes, great. So when do we bring out the cannons? God says, no, I just want you to march around once. Oh, okay. So the first day they do that. They just kind of march around. Trumpets are playing. Everybody else is silent. They march around the whole city one time and go back to camp. And God says, I want you to do it tomorrow too. They get up the next morning. They march around the city of Jericho. Everybody's down at the top looking down, making fun of them. They're quiet except the playing of trumpets. It happens a second time. It happens six straight days. And God said, get ready, because seven's going to be an amazing day. They go through the same ritual, only this time they march around it seven times. And the seventh time around, when the priests give a signal, everybody shouts with one voice, and this is how the Bible says it. When they shouted with one voice, it must have been a really loud shout, because all of a sudden, the walls of Jericho fell flat to the ground. Those 70 feet high, tall walls fell to the ground, and every Israelite charges into the city. 
And so now it's complete mayhem. The, the fight's raging, people are screaming, shouting, running. And in the middle of all of this chaos, Joshua turns to the two spies. And he says, don't forget about Rahab. Somebody go get Rahab. Now look at this, verse 25. But Rahab the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her, Joshua spared. I hope you have your Bibles here because there's a, there's a line here you may want to underline. Her family has lived in Israel ever since. Somebody needs to circle ever since. Those are some of the most powerful words in this whole story. Ever since. It's packed with so much meaning. And here's where I think the story gets really, really good. Listen, Rahab has been saved from death, right? She's just been saved from a terrible death. But does she now have a life to be saved for? She, she has this past. This is the used up woman. This is the abused woman. Is everybody... Is anybody ever going to want her again? Is anybody going to want to say, will you be my wife? Is she ever going to have a chance for a family? Or is she always going to be relegated to what has been? So Joshua and the Israelite army, they go on and they defeat city after city after city as God leads them. And Rahab and her family are just kind of camping along this little family in this pathetic little pup tent with this gigantic group of people marching around and they're on the little outskirts. There's Rahab living kind of a separate life as a nobody because nobody knows how to integrate a Canaanite into the Jewish family. And this goes on for I don't know how long, maybe a couple of weeks. It might have gone on for a couple of months. But one day there's an Israelite guy whose name is Salmon. And he spots Rahab, and he starts to pay attention to her, and he says one day, you know, she's kind of cute. And then he says, finally he gets up the courage to talk to her one day, and he says, you want to go out sometime? How about tomorrow? And guess what happens? Before long, this Jewish guy is falling in love with used-up Rahab, who has a past. And and this can't be right, see, because you weren't supposed to marry anybody outside of your nation, especially somebody who has this this shady past like Rahab's. Well, eventually, Salmon marries Rahab. And get the picture of this. There's, I don't know, maybe let's say there's 500,000 Jews traveling around in this gigantic pack. And so there's lots of couples for God to choose from. But for whatever reason, God says, I choose Salmon and Rahab. That's the couple I want. And they have a son named Boaz, who ends up marrying a woman whose name is Ruth. And Boaz and Ruth have a son named Obed, who ends up having a son by the name of Jesse, who ends up having a son named David, who eventually became king over all of Israel. And 28 generations later, there was a young couple from this same family tree. Guess what their names were? Joseph and Mary who have a son named Jesus of Nazareth. And somehow, by the grace of God, Rahab the unwanted, Rahab the messed up, Rahab the used up, Rahab the shady lady with the past, became the great, great grandmother of the Messiah of the world. Can you believe that? Why would God do that? And her family has been 
in the family ever since. I want to say to someone tonight, we serve an ever since God who doesn't just want to save you from death. He wants to save you for life. Because here's Rahab, she has a past, she's created for herself, and God is going to have a future that he creates for her. And I love that about our God. Because you know what? There's a whole lot of people that you and I both know. I know it's nobody in this room, but there's a whole lot of people we know who would not invite Rahab over to their house for dinner because of who she was. And yet God says, I'm going to make her part of my story. And you know what? She was the perfect choice because we are all people with a past. I have a past. We all deserve condemnation for what we've done. But God rescues us from our past and He gives us what we don't deserve which is a future with him. And you want to know how he did that? He did that because of a Passover when Jesus spread out his arms on a cross and he hung and he bled and he died and blood was spilled. And in that Passover, in the blood of the Lamb, all of us have our past erased. That's called the great Passover. That's the great exchange. And I want to ask you as we close tonight, just... A really personal question. I hope it's okay to ask you this. What's your label? I know your name, at least some of you, but what's your label? Joe the liar. Susan the arrogant. Steve, the addicted. Melissa, the insecure. We all have labels. And whatever is attached to your name, I want to tell you something. And I want you to hear me really clearly. You do not need to get your act together. What you need is a Savior. You don't need to get cleaned up. And this is what the story of Rahab tells us. God saves sinners while they are still sinners. It's not after they get cleaned up. It's not after they get their acts together. It's not after they straighten up and start walking right. But when you put your faith in Jesus, God takes over and He makes you who He wants you to be. And all of a sudden, you have a new label. David the redeemed, Mary, daughter of God, child of the king, that's the new label. Do you think Rahab's name had a label? Think about who she is today. One of the great women of our faith, the great, great grandmother of the Messiah, if God can do that for Rahab, He can do that for you. He's done it for me. He can do it for anybody. Would you bow your heads with me, please? I think there's, there's probably a variety of different people and experiences here tonight, but my guess is there's, there's really three big categories of people. One is, it's the person here who knows what they've been saved from, and your heart is filled with gratitude. I really hope and pray that no matter how long it's been since you've been a redeemed person, that you'll never forget where God has brought you from. And tonight, your heart needs to just be saying, thank you, God. Thank you for where you've brought me. Thank you for what you've saved me from. Thank you for what you've made me to be. It's all your grace. Tonight, just say thank you. There's another person here tonight who has been walking with the Lord 
maybe for a while, but you've never been able to get rid of your label. It just haunts you. And there are skeletons in your past and things in your kind of the dark places of your life that you just haven't been able to get through. And tonight I want to tell you, God wants to set you free. You're already in the family. Tonight, God just wants to remind you who you are. And he wants you to leave here with a huge burden lifted off of your back. And some of you, you're still carrying the weight of your sin. And the burden is crushing to you. The habits, the lifestyle, the disappointments, the heartbreak. It's almost more than you can take. And tonight, you just need to say, here I am, Jesus. Here I am in all of my brokenness, in all of my ugliness. If you can take and make anything beautiful out of my life, I give it to you tonight. Whoever you are, we're going to have a chance to pray around these altars. Some of you may just want to pray where you're sitting or standing. But we all have something to talk to God about. Let's stand together and let's just sing through that song. And if you want to respond in any way, nobody's going to judge you for wanting to be closer to God. Nobody's going to judge you for wanting more of God in your life. You're, we're here in a safe place. And if you just want to pray, and just talk to God about any of those things. Come right now as we sing. Amazing grace. Come and pray. How sweet the God loves you. Bring your burden to Him. Come and pray. Like me. There's nothing too hard for God. Thank you, Lord. Was blind, but now I see. Sing the next verse together. It was grace that told my heart to be. You remember? And grace my fear. Listen to this next verse. I just want to hear you sing it. Just sing it for us. Remind us of the kind of God we're talking about. Listen to these words. together. If you want to pray, come and gather around some friends. If you want to come and pray for yourself, that's fine too. Let's just close this service around the altars and praying together and seeking God together. Sing this last verse, would you please? Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have
I just want us to pray together tonight, and if you need to leave after the prayer, it's okay. If you could just kind of go quietly, but uh, God's at work here. You know, sometimes there's, uh, I don't know much about this stuff, I've read about it, that when significant things happen in our lives, that there's this chemical that's released in the brain that kind of sears it, sears it into your memory. Some of you have had some things seared into your memory that you'd, you'd like to forget. But I want to remind you tonight that the hope that we heard from this story from God's Word, I hope it's seared into your mind and your memory so that when the enemy comes knocking and reminds you of your past, you'll remember that you have a God who is for you and not against you. That's good for you. It might be good for someone that you know and love and care for who's, who's struggling and feels like they're not worthy. Would you remember this? Would you remember Rahab? Would you remember the grace of God? And would you be an extension of the hands and feet of Jesus? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this powerful wonderful, hopeful reminder tonight, directly out of your word, delivered by your servant tonight. And I pray, Lord, that as we pray around this altar and some who are praying right where they're seated or standing, and we're praying on behalf of ourselves, we're praying on behalf of people that we know and love, that they would feel worth and value that can only come through an encounter with a living God, Jehovah Jawi. So I pray, Heavenly Father, that not only would you meet needs right now in this place, and we know that you're here, I pray that there would be a release that Dr. Busey talked about earlier, that, that, that there would be some freedom in this place tonight from things that have been oppressive and memories that have been too powerful, and that we'd be reminded of the worth and the value, the grace of God that, that trumps it all. And in a little while as we leave this place, I pray as we filter out into our community and onto this campus, as we encounter people who may not quite understand all of this yet, somehow you'll give us the right words and spirit and attitude to tell the story and to see in others what you saw in them. Who knows what will happen, Lord, as a result of decisions that are made tonight. It might not even take 28 generations, but it, it will impact the next. And so, Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you still want to come and gather around, you can be seated if you need to leave. Lord bless you. We're so glad that you're here tonight, chapel tomorrow morning. And then a wonderful service tomorrow night on Friday night. So I hope you come back at 7 o'clock. Lord bless you.